morning and praise the Lord. Yes. Amen. Amen. Today we're going to be looking at recognizing God's call. We'll begin in uh, the book of Ephesians, the first chapter, verses 17 and 18 says this, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give to you the spirit of wisdom and revelation and the knowledge of him, the eyes of your understanding being enlightened, that you may know what is the hope of his calling, what are the riches of his glory, of his inheritance in the saints, and what is the exceeding greatness of his power toward us who believe according to the working of his mighty power. Let us pray. Father, we thank you, Lord, for being able to come into this house together today. Father, I pray that you would open up our minds and our hearts. I pray that you would anoint the word today, Father, that we would grasp the depth of what you have for us today, Lord. Let us draw close to you, comfort the hearts of those who mourn, strengthen the hearts and the health of those who cannot be here today that wanted to be. Father, I thank you again in Jesus' name. Amen. So today we want to take the opportunity to recognize what is the call of God on your life. Many people wonder this. They say, God, what is the call on my life? What am I here for? Today I want you to know it will be revealed. We'll see that it's not just one call on our lives. So let's start with the first. The first call is a call to salvation. Matthew 22, 14 says this, For many are called, but few are chosen. Now, Jesus says these words at the end of the parable of the wedding feast, and some may look at that verse and say, well, many are called, but few are chosen. You know, and, and, and they're like, well, maybe you were called, but I'm chosen, right? But the fact of the matter is, uh, let's take a look at the parable to see really what is the understanding of this particular verse. So in Matthew 22, we'll go here. It starts off, says, The kingdom of heaven is like a certain king who arranged a marriage for his son. And he sent out his servants to call uh, those who were invited to the wedding, and they were not willing to come. So here you have, there's people... The invitation went out to those who were invited, but they were unwilling to come to God. The invitation is, was given, and as quickly as it was given, it was dismissed by those who were invited. And there will always be those who will immediately reject the invitation to come to Christ. No matter how much you witness to them, no matter how good your approach is, they will immediately reject the invitation to come to Christ. They're simply unwilling to accept it. They're unwilling. Now he goes on in the fourth verse and he says, and again, he sent out other servants saying, tell those who are invited, see I have prepared my dinner. I'm, my oxen and fatted calf are killed and all things are ready. Come to the wedding. But they made light of it, and they went their ways to their own farms and another to his business. So there will be people who didn't flat out reject the invitation. Perhaps they thought it would be nice to go to a party, you know, have a nice dinner, celebrate a little bit. But you know what? It wasn't as important to go as their own lives were. They had more important things to do. And there are going to be many people who are told about heaven and they'll want to go, oh yes, I want to go to heaven, absolutely. But they're too busy in their own life really to take the invitation seriously. And it's what we call, these, these are those who are apathetic to the call or the invitation. He goes on in the sixth verse, and he says, and, and the rest seized his servants, treated them spitefully, spitefully, and killed them. But the king heard about it. He was furious, and he sent out his army to destroy those murderers, and they burnt up their city. You have those who hate God. They hate God's children, and they will persecute God's servants, even to the point of killing them. You can see the hatred even in our society toward Christianity. You know, I, I was thinking this morning 
that those who speak the loudest about tolerance are the most intolerant people out there. You know, you, if, if you don't accept us, no, wait, we don't want you just to tolerate us. We want you to celebrate with us. They become incredibly hateful. And you have those that are what I would call antagonistic toward the invitation of Christ. And, and know this, the, God will punish those who have blood on their hands. Now look here in the, the eighth verse, and he says this, and then he said to his servant, The wedding is ready, but those who were invited are not worthy. Therefore, go into the highways, and as many as you find, invite the, to the wedding. So the servants went out into the highways and gathered together all whom they found, both good and bad, and the wedding hall was filled with guests. So the invitation went out to as many as they could find. It, they sent them to the highways and the byways to gather all, both good and bad. And so it tells you that no matter what your past is, you don't have to check a mark to be invited, that this invitation went out to everyone that could be found. The words, in the words of Jesus, he says, Come unto me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you, give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. The call of salvation is for everyone. And we've seen that in the... In, in this parable. We've seen that there are those that are unwilling, there are those that are apathetic, there are those that are antagonistic. But I would be remiss if I didn't include one more group. Now look here in the 11th verse. But when the king came in to see the guests and he saw a man there who did not have on the wedding garment. So he said to him, friend, how did you come in here without a wedding garment? And he was speechless. And then the king said to the servants, Bind him hand and foot, take him away, cast him into utter darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of the teeth. Here is one who got the invitation and came to the wedding feast. The king noticed that he didn't have on the wedding garment. And the wedding garment represents being clothed in the righteousness of Christ. Here was a person who wanted the benefits without the condition. He represents those who want to go to heaven except without Christ. They were willing to accept the invitation, but it would be on their own terms. And as you can see, it did not go well with him. And, if you, and then we come to the verse that we started with, Matthew 22, 14, For as many are called but few are chosen. After looking at the context of what Jesus is teaching here, we can rightly conclude that many are called, but few choose. Few choose to accept the invitation. Few choose to accept the conditions of the invitation. There will always be those who are unwilling. There will be those who are apathetic. There are those who are even antagonistic. And then you have those who want the benefits without the condition. The call of salvation is for all. And that is the first call of God that is on your life. You have a call of salvation. The second call on your life is a call of self-denial. Luke 9 23 through 24 says this, And he said to them all, If anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross daily, and follow me. For whoever desires to save his life will lose it, and whoever loses his life for my sake will save it. For those who want to know what the call of God is on your life, know this, there is a call, of, a, a call on your life, a, one of self-denial. You may have those who who want to know what the call of God is on their life, and they'll look at this verse and they think that God is talking to somebody else. But look what he says here. If anyone, and this is for all who desire to come after him, let him deny himself. To come to Christ, it must be one of self-denial. 
and that we take up our cross. The cross represents burden, burdens and suffering and the death of that self-life. It's having the mindset that the Apostle Paul had when he wrote in Galatians 2.20, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I live now in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. What the Apostle Paul was talking about is that, that denial of self-life that we must die and Christ live in us. You know, the second president of the United States, John Adams, said that our Constitution was made only for a moral and religious people. It is wholly inadequate for a government of any other. You know, and in other words, unless our country remains a Christian, Christian, that our Constitution will not proper, uh, function properly. It's John, was John Adams right? I think so. Can our society survive without the Christian faith? And I'm talking about true Christians. Christians who have accepted the call of salvation on their life, who have accepted the call of self-denial. Can our nation continue? You know, and, and, and this is relevant because there you have people will say, well, you know, Christianity, uh, our, our country can uh, survive without Christianity. You, you just have to have good people, and, and that's what it, it is. But the fact of the matter is, is that's not true. It's not true. Dennis Prager, he is a, a, a Jewish social critic and scholar, and he has a favorite response to the question. You know, because people will say, well, there's, there's no really, there's no absolutes, there's no objective truth, it's what you feel. But the fact of the matter is he has this response and he says, say you're walking in an alley in a major city and you're, it's at night and your car is about 300 yards away in a dimly lit area and all of a sudden you see 10 men come walking towards you. His question is, wouldn't you feel much better knowing that they just came from a Bible study? <laughs> it's the truth, right? The fact is, is that every time he asks that question, the, the answer is yes. In spite of what people say and what the polls say, on a practical level, people acknowledge that religion has a positive influence. Our society cannot exist without Christianity. And it cannot function right. Indeed, our very Constitution will not work without the restraints of religion. And let me ask you one more critical question. Can Christianity exist without the cross? Let me answer that up front. No, it cannot. You remove the cross from our faith, and it's just a house of cards. It will crumble under the slightest weight. Why is that? What is Christianity without the cross? It is a sect without a savior. It is a doctrine without self-denial. All Christians have a call on their life and it is a call of self-denial. And another call that you have on your life is a call to suffering. You know, if you listen to a lot of the um, modern preachers today, the prosperity preachers, they'll tell you, come in the Christ in your life and it will be nothing but good times. They'll tell you that it is God's will for you to live in prosperity. They'll tell you that it's God's will for you to live in health. They'll give you the impression that trouble cannot touch a child of God. They'll tell you that there's no need for you to change your life. Just say this mystical prayer, but yet put money in their pockets, right? Right? But look what Peter says here in 1 Peter. He says, Servants, be submissive to your master with all fear, not only to do good and gentle, but also to the harsh. For this is commendable, if because of conscience toward God one endures grief, su suffering wrongly. He says, What credit is it if you are beaten for your faults and you take it patiently? So what he's saying is that if you are a servant uh, and, and your master tells you, you know, to do something and you don't do it and then you're beaten for it, he says, what good is that? But look what he, he goes on to say. 
But when you do good and suffer, if you take it patiently, this is commendable before God. For this, uh, for to this you were called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that you should follow in his footsteps. He's saying that he tells us that Christ suffered. He, and, and Jesus says, a servant is not above his master. That Jesus suffered in this life, and we may suffer in this life as well. But the fact is, is that as believers, we hold on to our faith. When we're lied to and tell, told that, oh, trouble's not going to touch a child of God, and then when it comes on you, you start thinking, my God, what, what's going on? Is God punishing me? The fact is, is that no. He tells us that this life will be full of trials. But what He does also tell us, He says, I will never leave you nor forsake you. That He's there to comfort us in our time of need. Look what Paul says in 2 Timothy 3, 12-13. He says, Yes, all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. But evil men and impostors will grow worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. Does that not speak of our society today? People are deceived and they are, they are deceiving and being deceived. Listen, we need to recognize that there is purpose even in suffering. And sometimes when you're in the midst of it, it's, it's hard to, to see. But it teaches us lessons. It tests our faith. It testifies to others. And it prepares us for service. You have a call of salvation on your life. You have a call of self-denial on your life. You have a call of suffering. But you also have a call of separation. 2 Corinthians 6, 17-18 says this, Therefore come out from amongst them, be ye separate, says the Lord. Do not touch what is unclean, and I will receive you. I will be a father to you, and you will be my sons and daughters, says the Lord Almighty. God's call on your life is for you to separate from this world. You have churches that believe that we need to resemble the world to win the world. This is clearly not the will of God. We are called to come out from amongst them. 1 John 2, 15 uh, through 16 says this, Do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life, is not of the Father, but is of the world. You have millions of people selling their souls for possessions, for pleasure, for popularity, for homes, diamonds, cars, trinkets. And, you know, and it's captured their devotion because they strive after these things. But we must set our affections on the things above and not the things of this world. We must set our mind on love, faith, prayer, Bible reading, Bible study, faithful church attendance, and stewardship. That's what we are to set our minds on because we have a call to come out from amongst them, says the Lord. We have a call of salvation, one of self-denial, one of suffering, one of separation, and lastly, we have a call to service. Mark 16, 15 says this, And he said to them, Go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Many Christians, they don't heed the God's call of service. They have excuses. They have lack of concern. God's call to service reaches out to all of us. Everyone can do something, whether it's prayer or encouraging one another, witnessing or lending a helping hand. You know, many years ago, this uh, missionary preached in a very remote area, uh, and it was poverty-ridden area of West Africa. He appealed to the support of the Christians there at the work that they were doing, and he was encouraging them to present a gift that they could put toward the construction of a building that would serve as a medical clinic and a place of worship. Approximately two hours after he gave this call, a young woman came back to the missionary and presented him with 
Now, $40 doesn't sound like a lot to us, but it was a ton of money there at that, at that place and at that time. And he wanted to know, he goes, where on earth did she get this money? Where did she get this money? And he didn't want to ask, but he finally asked, how did she get this large sum of, this large sum of money? You know, in such a painful and afflicted uh, circumstances. And it came to the fact that she had went out to a wealthy planter uh, and sold herself into service for the rest of her life. And why? It was her way of giving herself to the service of the Lord Jesus Christ. It wasn't given herself partially. She gave totally. It sounds kind of like a radical price to pay, doesn't it? However, if you think about their measure of commitment, you know, it, it is radical. We read the words of the Bible and it, it tells us that we are, commit, we are to commit our lives fully to the service of our Lord Jesus Christ. It is a lifetime service. It isn't just partial. You can call it anything you want, but don't call it what it, is, it isn't. It is everything. It is a total commitment. We are called to a life of service. You know, there was a sociologist, Robert Winthrop, at Princeton University, and he explored how everyday people make ethical decisions. And he found that, you know, that uh, the deeds of compassion, that service and mercy that was given to someone in their past uh, it, it changes the way that they make decisions moving forward. The caring uh, that we receive may touch us so deeply that we, we feel gratified when we're able to pass that along to somebody else. And there was a story that Jack Casey told that uh, when he was five years old, he had to get his teeth pulled, like five teeth at one time, and they were going to put him under general anesthesia, and, and he he said that when he was there, he was, he was visibly terrified. And this nurse came up to him and said, you know what, I'm going to be right here the whole way. You're going to be all right. And as soon as he woke up, there she was, standing over him with a smile. Years later, he had uh, become a, 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 a part of the rescue team, and uh, this truck had gotten into an accident and flipped over. The guy was trapped inside and there was gasoline dripping on him. And this guy was terrified that this thing was going to blow because they had to use machines to get, this, get, the, get it opened up to get him out of there. And he figured one spark would just set him ablaze. And he was terrified. He was screaming. And do you know that that young that boy who became a man he crawled up in there and said, I'm going to stay here with you until you get out. And sure enough, when they finally get him out, the driver looked at him and go, you're an idiot. Do you know that we could have both died and burnt up? And the fact is, is that he said, look, I couldn't leave you. I couldn't leave you because he knew what it was like. And I say all that to say this, that the love and the care that you give to someone will impact them so much that someday they're going to pass that along and impact somebody else's life. We have been given grace. Jesus is our greatest example of this. Jesus washed the feet of his disciples and then he told them to do the same. If I then, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example that you should do as I have done to you. You know, it wasn't just about washing feet. It was a lesson that we are to serve one another. So you say, what is the call on my life? Well, I'm here to tell you that it is a call of salvation. It is a call of self-denial. It is a call of suffering. It is a call of separation. And lastly, it is a call of service. Now go out and fulfill the call of God that is on your life. Let us pray. Father, I thank you again for your word. I pray, Father, 
that this word would stir up in us that we would fulfill the call of God that you have on our lives, that we would fulfill your call, Lord, and we can do it by the power of your Holy Spirit. We ask in the name of Jesus that you would fill us full of your spirit, that we might be changed, and that we might make a change in this world. I thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.